Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> my name is Debbie Cabry from debbiecabry.com.au. And tonight, I'm supposed to be talking to you about managing overwhelm. And I think that's quite hilarious, really, given the fact that I am running the best part of 35 minutes late due to so much to do. So I'm going to tell you the story of my overwhelm today. So I'm a mum of four kids. And today I went to work. And then I um, had to, to finish work, get, get to the supermarket, at which time my telephone died because it went out of charge. Then I went off and grabbed groceries for dinner, rushed home to find my daughter sick. <laughs> then, <laughs> hi everybody, <laughs> then I managed to get dinner started, had a fight with my son, hubby went out for a run, the vegetables wouldn't boil, <laughs> wouldn't boil. So... I'm just like you, a bit overwhelmed. So I am a clinical social worker and a relationship coach and I've got a private practice in Brisbane, Australia and I work with women and couples all the time on all sorts of topics to do with relationship. This topic, <laughs> this topic is top of my priority list today. So how to manage overwhelm when, you know, life can be really challenging so if you would like to, those that have joined, if you want, there's a share button um, below. If you want to share this with your friends or people who you think might benefit from hearing some information about managing overwhelm, then please go ahead and share it. At the end of this, I'm going to have an opportunity for people to ask me questions if they want to. But now I'm just going to jump in <laughs> because I'm already running so late. So basically... How blessed are we to be in 2017 with women? It's just brilliant, isn't it? You can have a job. You can have a family. You can uh, go back to university or go to university for the first time. You can vote. You can have a marriage that is not based on the need of financial support, but in actual fact, based on um, love and connection, which, you know, not that long ago was not the case. So here we are, we women. Aren't we just the blessed ones, <laughs> are we? I don't know if we are. Because look at the price we pay for all this great stuff we have. So I don't know about you guys, but I know from my perspective, like I have my private practice. I have other businesses that I work in. I do online work. I have a family of four kids. I have a home to run. It's exhausting. Like it is absolutely exhausting and that doesn't even start to touch the other things like perfectionism having to do it perfectly not being able to say no uh, taking on more than we should or could manage so how many of you wake up in the morning and literally go oh my god it's another day I speak to women every single week who go, I literally roll over in bed and think, you've got to be kidding me. Like, here we go again. It's Groundhog Day. And I literally put my feet on the floor and it's boom and I'm off. It's like, pff, hit the, round, the ground running, you know. Might be a case of getting your kids organised for school, organising lunches, getting yourself ready for work and getting out the door at some god-awful hour, usually. So... You know, if we begin our day from a space of exhaustion, which a lot of people do, you know, it's going to mean that as time goes on, we become more and more depleted. So you have a cup, <laughs> a cup, you can use what's in it, but you know what? As you use it, it gets smaller. And so bottom line is, it's not, it's not never ending. There is just a finite amount that you can have and then it's gone um, and I think women just think, oh, well, I'll just keep pushing on. I'll just keep doing, I'll just keep doing. And it'll be all right. I don't think so. Not from where I sit. So I see women who come into my clinic desperate, but they don't talk about their stuff. They'll start about, um, I'm worried about my kid. My relationship isn't going well. I've got problems at work. And, and inevitably, I end up sitting down talking about things like, how far are you stretched? You know, like, and some women will say to me, I feel so stretched. I'm stretched like a rubber band that's going to snap. Um, women who talk about just having nothing left to give. So they're just exhausted beyond themselves, like absolutely exhausted to their bones. Women who talk about they're not being enough, you know, I give and I give and I give and I give and I give. And, and there just isn't enough. There's not enough time in the day. There's not enough energy in my day. 
um, I, f I just feel completely drained. And of course, if we continue like that for a decent period of time, and I'm not talking a year or two, I'm talking, you know, a month or two, then what happens is, you know, your adrenal glands don't like you very much and you get fatigued and your cortisol levels, which is your stress hormone, goes through the roof. And so we start to have physical issues, we can't sleep properly. And generally speaking, we could be a little bit nasty to live with. <laughs> so you might end up being resentful, angry, frustrated, short-tempered, miserable. All right, so I'm just looking at my notes. So what's the antidote to this? What do we do to try and resolve this? And I don't know about you guys, but if anybody wants to pipe in, what do you do to manage this stuff? I see a few of you on there. So what kind of things do you do to try and manage this exhausting experience? And when I ask women in my clinic, a very usual answer is there's nothing I can do because who, who, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? If I don't do it, who else is going to do it? Okay, so let's have a look at the starting point for resolving this. And I guess the starting point is three selves, you know, things that, that women often struggle with. So self-care, self-compassion, and self-acceptance. You know, those things are key to shifting things. But the, the one thing that is talked about constantly is self-sacrifice. We have all heard, you know, put on your, your oxygen mask before everybody else on the airplane. We all know this stuff, but we're not doing it. Why aren't we doing it? What's going on that we just don't think we should do it? And I think it is about those three things, self-care, self-compassion, self-acceptance. I think women expect themselves to be perfect all of the time. If you'd have heard me giving myself a beating before this live about, I should have been on there earlier, I should have been more organized, nobody helps me, I'm so sick of it. You know, but, but I had put the pressure on myself ultimately because I could have pulled the pin, I could have gone, you know what, I'm really busy, this hasn't worked out, I'll just leave it but I wouldn't allow myself to do that. So we need to give ourselves permission sometimes to just go, nope, this can't happen. I can't do it right now. I don't have the time, the energy or the inclination and learn to just go no to people. I can't, I, I'm really sorry, but I can't do it. Um, self-care is something that, <laughs> that I talk to women about a lot. Women make me laugh. You know, when I talk to them about self-care, they say things like, Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I go and have a massage twice a year or, oh, yeah, my self-care is really good, you know. Um, once a year I go for a weekend with my girlfriends. Well, that actually technically is not self-care. That's survival. You know, self-care is a daily act. It's something you do every single day that's built into your week so that, sorry, built into your day so that you can actually really genuinely take care of yourself, whether that's having a sleep in, whether that's getting the kids to do their lunch for themselves so you've got an extra 10 minutes to get ready for work, whether that's making sure you have a walk outside during daylight hours, whether that does mean fitting in an exercise class around your family, um, whether it means saying no to everybody in your family and saying, well, you guys have to cook the dinner tonight, I can't do that. Self-care is a daily um, practice. And if we don't do it daily, it just doesn't work. And so many women wait until they're in absolute crisis and on their knees before they'll actually access their self-care. Um, self-compassion, which is something I am extraordinarily um, passionate about. Self-compassion is, is so important. If you think about the way you treat your girlfriends, the way you treat your children, the way you treat your partner, you know, we, we extend ourselves out and say, what can I do to help you? What do you need from me? We want to be of service. We want to help. But we don't actually allow ourselves to do that. We don't check in and go, you know, what do I need right now? Do I need to have a rest? Do I need to talk to a girlfriend? Do I need to just have a night out? Do I need to tell everybody to leave me alone? What do I need right now? And remind ourselves that we're just like everybody else. That we, we get tired, we get grumpy, we get overwhelmed. And that, you know, it's okay. We can give ourselves permission to say, you know what, it's all right. It's all right that I'm feeling like this. You know, and when we do that, when we're kind to ourselves like we would do to a child or to a friend or to a partner, 
we, we demonstrate to our children self-compassion. We demonstrate self-care so that they know how to look after themselves better when they get older and what their limits are. Self-acceptance, of course, is really challenging. I don't know too many women who are very self-accepting, to be honest with you. You know, the I'm not good enough story, the I, I, you know, I'm invisible story, the who do you think you are story. You know, women who really give themselves an extraordinarily hard time. I think, you know, self-acceptance is about, you know, I'm good enough. You know, if you get up in the morning and you suck in oxygen, you're good enough. If you don't go through your life deliberately trying to hurt people, then you are good enough. And so it's really important. Self-acceptance is this space of just looking at ourselves with all of our flaws, like all of them, and just going, hmm, I'm all right, though. You know, I'm okay. And I think... That, those three things are so important if we want to start to manage the overwhelm because from those three, those three foundational points, we have an opportunity to look after ourselves better, be kinder to ourselves. Um, so that's sort of the cornerstone or the foundation of trying to manage the overwhelm. Now, because you women, you want practical <laughs> suggestions as well. It's like, great, great, that's good. So what can I do, though? So let me tell you some things you can do. So I think it's essential, and I do this myself, right? So I, I never offer any suggestions to any women that I don't do myself. I, like I said, I'm a mum. I've got four kids. I've got two kids with, with different needs. I have a job and other things that I do. I have an online practice, a face-to-face -face practice. I run a household. I've got a partner. Life's pretty full on, trust me. But every single day, no matter what, in my diary is some time for me. So every single day, whether it's raining, the sun is at 400 degrees in Brisbane or not, I get outside and I exercise. And the exercise is essential to me for lots of reasons. Number one, I'm in my 50s and I don't want to get osteoporosis, so I need to exercise. Number two, um, it actually gives me some time and space to breathe and think without noise and interruption. Number four, it gives me vitamin D, which is super important as a, to help us to keep our mental state well. Exercising is incredibly important, you know, trying to get 10,000 steps a day into your day. The average person does about two and a half thousand, so it's important for my heart, for my brain. But in addition to that, it sets the tone for my day. So when I do my exercise, I do some gratitude, I do some intention setting, I think about what my goals are, I think about my family. And in that time, it is me, 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 me. No phone, nobody being able to talk to me, just doing my exercise, usually with vinegar water because that's also good for you. <laughs> So that's what I do. This is like the beginning of my, my day. It sets the tone for my day. And I hear women say, I can't do that. Anybody, anywhere can get outside for 15 minutes. I do 45, but you don't have to do 45. Do 15. You know, I can't do it. Get off the bus two stops earlier to work and leave 10 minutes early. Um, you can get out of your building if you're working for lunch. Instead of sitting down and, and eating at your desk, have your food at a table and get outside and exercise. So exercise is really important. Setting a time aside every day, you know, it does my head in when women say, I don't have time. You know what? Push some other people from the top of your list down because you pay a price if you don't have time. Because the person who doesn't get what they need is you. And that's not okay. It's not okay that everybody else gets their needs met except for you. That's not all right. So carve it out. I suggest put it in a diary. Do not delete it. Do not write it in pencil. Put it in pen. Do not alter it for anything. If anybody asks you for anything in that time, the answer is, nope, I'm really sorry. I've got something else to do. And you don't have to explain what it is. It's nobody's business but yours. So try, if you can, to put some space in your day somewhere. At the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, in the middle of the day, find a space for you. Number two, very important. Learn to say no to people. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, right, but if you say yes to something when you actually want to say no, you get really, really resentful. There is nothing worse than saying, oh, yeah, okay, okay, because you don't want to offend and upset. Again, the other person is more important than you. And you end up stretched like a rubber band, meeting their need, 
when in actual fact you need to take care of your need learning to say no to people for some people that's really hard and I get it but you can practice it you, you can practice by saying you know I'd really love to help you but I can't today or you know what I'm just absolutely flat out if I can do it in a couple of weeks or months time I'm absolutely willing to do that but saying no is really important it's setting boundaries which is essential but it means you're not sitting there stewing and resenting the hell out of what you've agreed to do. I mean, that's not good, right? Would you want somebody to do something for you if they resented you for it? I wouldn't. I can tell you that for nothing. I need some water because I'm really thirsty. Hang on. So, saying no is really important. There's a price to pay for saying yes when you mean no. There's a price to pay for saying yes if you continue to do it for the other person. And that is you can seriously end up resenting them a lot. And that means you probably feel angry and frustrated. Not really a good place to be, really. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Something else that I do, and I mentioned before, was gratitude. You know, research is really... I, I like to be research-based, right? Even if I smile and laugh about it, I like to be research-based. So there's two things, right, that absolutely change your emotional state and your mental health state if you do them. One is... Act, actively doing something towards gratitude and the other is happiness and laughter, right? And playfulness. So these, you go, oh, that doesn't seem too hard. But how many women don't do it? I try, and you, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be massive. This can be a bite-sized piece. If you're in the bathroom, you can go, what am I grateful for right now? Well, I'm grateful I'm in the bathroom because some people don't even have a bathroom, right? I'm grateful that I had a nice lunch. I'm grateful that I talked to my girlfriend today. I'm really grateful that um, I have technology. I have the internet. I have telephones. I'm really grateful that there's food on the table. You can come up with things that you're grateful for, and you can use that stuff with your family to teach them about gratitude. Have a jar in your house where you say to everybody a couple of times a week, write something that you're grateful for on a piece of paper. Stick it in the jar, and in our house we have Sunday roast. So Sunday roast comes, and you can open that stuff and talk about it and go, here's some stuff our family has gratitude for, because in our current culture we are consumers, and oftentimes we don't show gratitude. Gratitude is a value. If you don't share gratitude with your children and demonstrate gratitude and explain to them what gratitude is, guess what? They're going to be very grateful people. And being, having gratitude actually improves your mood. So it's a great idea for you and your family, right? Um, the other thing that I was going to say, and I've lost my thread on my nose, <laughs> happiness. That's what I was talking about. So, you know, when we feel, when we have laughter in our life, when we are playful in our life, um, we actually increase um, our optimism levels, our, our, life, our life satisfaction levels, like generally how we feel just generally about life. Um, our happiness, positivity, it actually lowers anxiety and depression. So laughter, playfulness and gratitude are better than an antidepressant. <laughs> so do them. Um, and again, it's about prioritizing. I know women say, playful, how can I be playful? I'm so tired. And, and so we get onto the hamster wheel, right? I'm too tired to be playful. Um, and I don't say no to anything, so I'm too tired. And, and down and down and down we go. Setting some t and it, we don't have to do this for an hour or half an hour. You can do this for two minutes. Um, three, four, five, six, ten times a day. Do you know what I mean? These don't have to be massive chunks of time that you've put aside. You know, you can stop for a minute and get playful with your kids. And that might mean watching some ridiculous YouTube video they're going to show you and laughing your head off because it's really silly. Or sharing a moment that was funny with somebody else or watching something humorous or listening to something humorous. You know, there are things we can do that will increase our, laugh uh, our playfulness. And in actual fact, and this is a therapeutic tool, which is weird, if you laugh, like, even though you're not laughing, if you make the laughter noise, you know, your brain will actually make you start to really laugh. So if you make the laughter noise, you, it's quite contagious, and it actually will increase your happiness, and you will begin to laugh quite naturally, even if you do it falsely to begin with. So basically, it's about carving out little spaces it's about reducing stuff down and carving out little spaces we need to let go of being perfect whether it's our kids are perfect because they do 10 activities a week 
way too many activities. You know, one or two a week is more than most kids need. They just need a couple of activities if they're going to do any. Reduce that down. Share the transporting of your kids with other mums so that you don't have to do it every week. Um, get your kids to help out. No, their beds will not look like they look when you make them. They're going to be scruffy and a bit lopsided. So what? Doesn't really matter. Um, share in the cooking. And yes, you know, it's hard because you have to tell them what to do. But the bottom line is they need to learn the skill set of cooking. And um, it means that your cooking time is cut in half if, you're, if your family is giving you a hand. You know, get everybody to spend an hour on Saturday or Sunday going, OK, let's bust out these chores together and get everybody to help. Even littlies can help. So let go of it being perfect. And, and my new mantra is deliciously imperfect and that's what we need to be that's what we need to encourage our relationships to be our families to be and ourselves to be deliciously imperfect you know giving yourself permission to go you know as I am as I show up today I'm okay you know I'm good enough all right, I have rambled on. Yes, I have. There's still a few of you sitting in the background there quite quietly. If anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask me about managing, uh, managing um, overwhelm, I'm really happy to answer them. You can either answer, I can either ask me here live now, or if you prefer, you can actually put them in the comments below and I'll answer them privately. Or if you'd like to, you can private message me because I do respond to those too. Um, like I said, I work with women and couples to be deliciously imperfect. So I help people to manage the stuff and teach techniques to help you learn how to do the stuff. And if you're interested in that, I offer 15 minutes um, free calls. So there's a, a thing up there on my Facebook page which has um, appointments. Just click on there and, and, and book a 15-minute call with me and I can have a chat with you. All right, as nobody has said anything, what I might do is I might just give you a couple more seconds and then I might get off because I got on late. So I need to get off. All right, I see thumbs coming up on the screen, but nobody's saying anything. But anyway, I'll have a bit of water if you want to. If you would like to sort of ask me a question, now's your chance to do it. And I'm happy to answer anything, so just throw anything at me. Um, and if not, I will finish up for tonight. Gosh, I'm so thirsty these days, it's not even funny. Hi, Kylie. How do you manage meditation time? Ooh, that is a brilliant question. Kylie, I guess it depends. If you've got little kids, or because um, if you have little kids, it can be super challenging to do meditation time, and you really need your partner in on that because you're going to need somebody to actually give, the, give you the quiet space to do it. But... If meditation is too tricky because of the age of your children, you can do mindfulness practice and you can do that as you do any activity. So you can mindfully wash the dishes, you can mindfully um, spend time with your kids. And it's not quite meditation, but it's about bringing yourself into the present moment without judgment. And that can be super, super help, uh, helpful if you can't meditate. But if you have a partner who is able to take your kids off you or your kids sleep and you have an opportunity when they're sleeping or you can do it after they've gone to bed at night and it's about really juggling your time and making sure that you block in a period of time and go, okay, nobody disturbs me during this time. And I had one mum who used to stick a do not disturb sign on the bedroom door when she would go in to have some quiet time by herself. So it means being really quite flexible depending on what your circumstances are um, if you have teenagers it's about saying hey guys you need to be respectful of my time I need to do this this is important to me please can you just leave me to get on with it um, and yeah and again there are lots you know you can do meditation in motion you know things like tai chi and meditation in motion you can do it when you're swimming you can do it when you're exercising to sort of just still yourself down a bit. So you get creative is the answer to that, Carly. So I hope that answered your question. If there are any more questions, just pop them below. Like I said, I'm happy to answer your questions. And Carly, if that didn't answer your question well enough, just drop me a PM and I'm more than happy to sort of, sort of tease out some other things that you might be able to do. Um, 
Yeah, it did. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Kylie. All right, if anybody else has anything they'd like to say, like I said, pop it in the box below. It's really interesting for me because what I see on lives is an eyeball at the top of my screen that tells me how many people are watching, but it doesn't tell me um, if you're sitting there quietly and you don't make a comment, it doesn't tell me who you are, so it's tricky for me to um, call you by name. But anyway, if you, there are some people watching. If you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and do it. I'll stay around for another minute or so. And then if not, I will pop off. And that's what we used to call farting when my kids were little. I won't pop off. What I will do is I will leave. I will leave this live. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, I'm having some water, giving you a second, and then I'm going to go. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. I really appreciate you coming on. I, I try and get on every Thursday evening at 7.30 EST, Australian Eastern Standard Time. Um, the events are always up on my page so you can check what's coming up. I'm more than happy to do uh, Q&A. So if you have a question that you would like me to answer on a live, you can send that to me privately and I'll address it in the live without giving your name, of course. Um, so you're more than welcome to do that too. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're very, very quiet. And so I am going to go off to get on with the rest of my evening, which hopefully won't be too chaotic because I'm a bit tired. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for joining me. Like I said, if you want to talk to me, you can PM me, grab a free call with me, um, or just make a comment below. Thanks very much for joining me, guys. Bye.